We're not meant to be vegans as humans. The teeth are the main indicators for what we should be eating. Skipping dinner is better than skipping breakfast. Half of the food feeds you and half of the food kills you. There's no one diet fits all. The easiest way to destroy the gut microbiome is or good bacteria is through antibiotics. So these are killers because herbicides, yeah. we know they kill the gut flora. Anything too concentrate can be bad. And sugar is highly addictive because so fish used to be the best protein and not mm. anymore. Top five foods to heal the gut. I mentioned a few like Okay. Like, these are healthy for the gut. When you mix science and traditions, you understand better how we should eat. Today we are joined by Dr. Khairala, and we are aborting the topic of gut health because you are guaranteed to fail in the long run if your health is not in check, especially as a high performer. So today we're learning from Dr. Khairala, who's an evidence-based expert on nutritional therapy, gut health, and hormone optimization that's featured on national TV and has trained and optimized national and international athletes to reset their health for peak energy, mood, and focus. So this is what it's going to get for you today. We're going to try to make it as simple, effective, practical as possible so you know exactly what to do and you get a lot of value from this episode. So, Hi, Adi. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So before we go into the signs of bad gut health, which through your poop, your skin, everything else, we're going to go through all these items and rate them from one to 10, depending on how bad it is for your health and your gut. And so let's start with the first one, soda. Thank you. So basically, uh, this was created initially and was sold at pharmacies to help people with digestion, digestive issues to help them digest better. And that's big thanks to its uh, high level of acidity. Mm. So people with low hydrochloric acid in the stomach, they have better digestion when they take it. Okay. Unfortunately, it has a lot of sugar. It's the second most common ingredient. And it has also phosphoric acid, caffeine, and some flavorings. So these could also favor a lot of fungus and mold in the gut, candida, etc. Okay. And they could also leach a lot of minerals from the from the tissues in the body, you know. Okay. Including caffeine itself can do that and the phosphoric acid. So uh, out of ten? Seven. Okay. So soda, seven out of ten. The next one, ketchup. <laughs> so usually tomatoes, I mean a lot of them are leftover tomatoes from the industry, so okay. uh, they could harbor mold, and it has sugar and uh, a bit of spices, uh, flavorings that could harbor also MSG. It's not listed, but they say it's a mix of sp uh, flavorings. What so does M MSG mean? Monosodium glutamate, which is a taste enhancer. Okay. That could also affect gut health and brain health. Okay. So scale of 1 to 10, I would say 7 as well. 7 out of 10. Yeah. And is there any replacement, organic forms? There of are there are better, yeah, better uh, forms of better ingredients. I mean, more organic, no artificial flavorings. Okay, interesting. No sugar. Number That's, three, yeah. chewing gum. <laughs> this has a lot of sweeteners in the form of sugar alcohols, sorbitol, maltitol, xylitol, maltitol syrup, etc., which could increase bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, which is called SIBO, which could increase the symptoms of uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. And the people prone to diarrhea can get more diarrhea. It has okay. a laxative effect. So out of 10, I would say 8, 9. 9? Nine. Okay. 8 to 9, 8 to 9 out of 10. Eight because it, it creates a bit of disturbance in the gastrointestinal system. In the gut. System. Okay. The gut. Now... This one. <laughs> Number four, <laughs> the dumbbell. Oh, I can train with it. <laughs> the mass gainer. So ingredients, maltodextrin can favor also bad fermentation in the gut. Uh, inulin, which is a good fiber, could also increase in people with bacterial overgrowth, could make them uh, like, uh, you know, bloated. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's definitely caseinate, that's milk protein deriv deriv derivative which is also somehow equivalent to MSG in terms of stimulation, but yeah. acts, acts like also for mass gain, you know, they use it for yeah. mass gain. Um, it has, it could cause in people with prone to casein intolerance, casein intolerance, they could have more intestinal issues. Oh, really? So okay. with, yeah, with cow milk protein intolerances. So people okay. with allergies to cow milk protein, etc., they can have a lot of bloating due to that and mm -hmm. indigestion. Um, Otherwise, the sucralose, the sweetener, also can create havoc in the microbial flora of the gut and mm -hmm. uh, create lead to more bloating. 
Okay. So that's it. So out of, uh, for the gut health, definitely out of 10, um, 8, 9. Oof. That bad, yeah. We've had a question. We've had a, a question. A lot of people suffer from uh, gut issues when they take these. When they take these. Because we've had yeah. a question from uh, one of our listeners um, that's called Eli Shibli, and he asked us, what are the negative effects of whey protein? Uh, is there whey, whey itself is good. Whey is good. This is the, the, the added, added, you know, additives, you know, that are problematic. Oh, so it's the additives, the, yeah. the sugar. Whey the whey itself, if you don't have whey intolerance or whey allergy, it's so fine. Usually it's not casein. Whey is a different uh, protein in milk. So it doesn't... And it does help with for muscles. And it has, ha, does help with insulin resistance, decrease it. But the problem is the additives. The additives. This okay. is 51% of it is maltodextrin. What does that mean? It's, it's a... Uh, relatively short chains of uh, st- of carbs, you know, that are broken down from uh, malt, you know, barley malt, okay, or, or rice malt, and they uh, they use a sweetener and for energy, and they could create also a lot of bloating in people who have fungus and mold, etc. Okay, very interesting. Fifty one percent of the mass, you know, <laughs> interesting. So. Um, whey protein powder is not bad. If you get grass-fed whey protein, it's very good. Okay. Before we get into the hydration drink and the chocolate, what about a banana? Bananas usually are, are fine, except for people who have um, uh, like mold in the gut. Uh, it's very rich in amylose, which feeds mold and can let, lead people to have more bloating when they okay. have it. So some people don't tolerate bananas just because of this high level uh, of amylose, okay. especially in, in overripe bananas. Oh, okay. But if someone has, a, like say, bacterial infection, diarrhea due to bacterial infection, it can help with the gut health. So this oh, is, so it can help. So this is 50-50. I'd say five, you know. Five, 50-50, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so to get into the main event hydration drink yeah i mean overall good ingredients except for um they have a bit of uh where is it here because it says two grams of sucralose. sugar only again sucralose yeah they have sweeteners like ssl fam k and sucralose and uh sucralose can create havoc in the gut uh, they have also um um bit of uh, what's it here okay that's it that's, that's the main problem i mean i would give it i mean rating uh for the gut uh let's say six six because uh, of the sucralose unfortunately if they had put another one it would be great um i've lowered the i realize when i do drink that hydration drink i feel bad after mm. it, why you could be reacting to sucralose or to some of the B, B vitamins because they're synthetic B vitamins. So they could create uh, re- bad reactions. A lot of the synthetic B vitamins, they can create bad reactions. A lot of people consume this very frequently, like daily. Would it be a recommendation to consume this hydration drink? No. No. Not mine, at least. Not okay. For, for the people I treat or help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. So I love this. Um, now let's get into the signs of bad gut health. You don't want to talk about this. Sorry. We'll talk about it after <laughs> with the sugar. <laughs> um, before we get into the, so what are the signs of bad gut health? I saw a video um, by Stephen Barlett and also an expert on gut, he- gut health that says that your poo or your skin can be an indicator of bad gut health. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely the poo because I mean, if it's like uh, goat uh, goat poo, like you know, like small fractionated or very mushy, okay, or diarrheic, you know, it's, they could could be signs of bad fermentation in the gut, indigestion, bad fermentation, l- l- bacterial or mic- other microbial overgrowth like uh, fungal overgrowth, mold overgrowth, etc. So these are could be indicators that someone is not digesting properly. And uh, it can reflect definitely on the skin health mm-hmm. uh, with people with, um, for example, uh, seborrheic dermatitis or uh, acne rosacea on the face. You know, they could, it could be all signs of uh, bad fermentation and indigestion in the gut. Okay. Interesting. Does acne have to do anything with it? or Acne has to do uh, mostly in the studies with uh, cow milk consumption, casein, especially in girls. Okay. So it's not chocolate like they used to think. It's mostly milk itself, especially rancid milk, you know, because it's processed milk. Mm. The fat gets rancid and the growth factors and the proteins, also proteins side of the milk 
it could lead to increased, uh, you know, comedogenesis, we call it, formation of white comedons, you know, on the skin. Okay. And then later it could degenerate into acne. Oof, interesting. Very interesting. So I saw a video also that talked about, first of all, before we talk about that, um, how should your poo look to know if you have a healthy gut? It should be like sausage uh, shaped. Sausage shaped. Well formed, good consistency, you know. Easy okay. to easy to evacuate. <laughs> easy to <laughs> evacuate. In less than three minutes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> Interesting. And for the skin, what is a, a, a healthy skin? Healthy skin is shows with it has normal glow, uh, no redness, excessive redness, no uh, not pale neither. Okay. So this is healthy skin. I mean, fair complexion for fair people. Dark. I mean, for darker skin people, normal complexion. I mean, the dark complexion. So it depends on the natural skin that they have. But definitely no pimples, no uh, white spots, or uh, you know, melasma, which is like uh, dark dark spots. Okay. And no redness, no inflammation showing. You know, no no enlarged vessels. You know. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Very interesting. So let's get into the sugar. So this is my personal addiction. I have a, sometimes I control myself, but this is probably one of the best, and he agrees, Paul agrees, one of the best snacks I've ever had. So what do you think about it? Rating <laughs> one to 10? Because sugar has been a big Let me check it out. problem of mine. We'll get into it. So number one ingredient is sugar. So definitely it could cause uh, for bad fermentation or uh, proliferation of mold and fungus. Mm -hmm. Too much sugar. Whole milk powder for people sensitive to milk, they could get uh, reaction. That's it. I mean, that, that, that are the main issues. Okay. So no issues. They, they, they chose, it's non-hydrogenated vegetable fat palm, fat, you know, palm fat. So it's non-hydrogenated, which is okay. I mean, they did better than other brands. You know? so <laughs> okay. Hydrogenate. So that's fine. I mean, uh, basically these are the two main issues. And it has wheat flour, definitely for people who have gluten intolerance, it's not suitable if they have a celiac disease or gluten intolerance. Yeah. We're going to talk about gluten after also. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. I mean, rating, I would say uh, six also because of the, Sugar and milk, but anyway, I mean, it's uh, it's not very bad. Mm. I mean, it's not my... Health? I wouldn't... Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I look for healthier versions of the snacks. You know? <laughs> what, what are some healthier versions of snacks? Before we get into sugar and the problems, craving, addiction, all the rest, what are some healthier snacks? I mean, definitely fruits, you know, and some uh, lightly roasted nuts. And mm. you can, I mean, homemade snacks, if you want to make something like this, dark chocolate, but of good brands, you know, that are not... Uh, like, what do you recommend? Do you have any recommendations, good brands? Yeah, but I'm not here to advertise any brand. Okay. But usually, I mean, if you look at the brands that are in, to, in terms of dark chocolate that are low ranking in terms of cadmium concentration and lead concentration, okay. there are top five okay. in the world. You look for the top five low in cadmium okay. and dark chocolate, you find the best brands. Okay. <laughs> okay. I meant because I, I usually, I bought dark chocolate the other day, but I saw the behind and I was like, no way I eat this. Yeah, it yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> so that's why I'm asking. Us. Okay. So to get into sugar, sugar is an issue I've been facing for a long time, mm. a very hard addiction that I'm pretty sure a lot of people deal with. I want to know how do you stop this drug? Because it's kind of like a drug. How do you... What's your advice on, on this? First, I mean, any uh, sugar is uh, found in fruits and found in vegetables. Yeah. And uh, also when you break down carbohydrates, starches in your gut, it turn, they turn into glucose also, which is kind of okay. one, one simple sugar. Um, the body wants sugar because normally in nature it's rare. Ah, you okay. know, so if you look at what's, what's there in nature normally, I mean... In, like 100,000 years ago when people, they used to be hunter-gatherers mostly. And they, uh, sugar was scarce and used to be found mostly in, uh, in season, like in spring and summer when, and sometimes in, the, in autumn when they find fruits on the trees. Mm. But otherwise, it was a rare occurrence. Mm. And they could find it some, sometimes in tubers or uh, roots, you know, like beetroot, uh, carrots, uh, tubers like potatoes, sweet potatoes, etc. So the body wants sugar because it's one of the main sources of energy for the cells. But too much of anything, even if it's good, it can be bad. 
So when we humans found ways of concentrating sugar from first from uh, cane, you know, sugar cane, and then later from beets, uh, they they refined it and uh, polished it, and you know, like, uh, mm. and ultimately you you have it depleted of all the minerals of the vi- and the vitamins that are normally found in the fruit or the vegetable. And the body needs these minerals and vitamins to process naturally, to metabolize the sugar into, mm. into energy. So ultimately, if you consume too much of it, you'll reach a point you're not getting, you have an out, you're out of balance in terms of vitamins and minerals because you're not getting enough of these to be able to metabolize the sugar. So a lot of it can go in the wrong pathways, you know, or accumulate into fat or go into lactic fermentation, etc. in the cell which can promote uh, disease, you know, ultimately, instead of ge- going into uh, the healthy pathways of the mm. metabolism in the cells. Anything too concentrate can be bad, you know. Even cocaine, originally, like in Peru, they used to drink teas from coca leaves to be able to climb the mountains. It was not that bad, but when they refined cocaine out of coca leaves, it got into a drug, and th- that's bad. And the same for sugar. And sugar is highly addictive because your body tells you when you, your brain tells you basically when you eat it. I mean, it tells you, "Bravo, you know, congratulations, <laughs> because you got to the <laughs> you found the gold. You found the gold, exactly. It's a high level of energy, but ultimately, it's detrimental to your health because <laughs> it's so um, so extreme, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of the concentration. Ultimately, you get, uh, of course, addicted to it because of this, you know, like reaction of the brain telling you, "Yes, mm-hmm. I want that more of that." And ultimately, at the level of the gut, it feeds, like I mentioned previously, fungus and mold. And these, when they multiply, at some point in time, especially at night, they're not, they lack food because they've multiplied and uh, they, you know, they, 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 their lifespans are much shorter than ours and they, mm. they can move very fast you know, mm. and, and multiply fast. So ultimately, they reach a point at night when they're very hungry. They've consumed all the sugar that you've eaten <laughs> and they need more so they can find their way across the intestinal barrier, you know, into the bloodstream Oof. to feed on the sugar in, the bl- in your blood. And this can create a lot of problems. So you get drops in your blood sugar at night you d- without noticing this, you know. Okay. Of course, your body would adjust by secreting, uh, you know, hormones that compensate for that mm-hmm. by increasing, you know, cortisol, adrenaline, etc., other hormones, glucagon. Do you feel more hormones. stressed? Or? You feel at, at night, yes. These are stress hormones. You get like a surge of stress hormones while you're sleeping. And this could also ruin the way, the, the quality of your sleep. Mm. So this is one of the things that could happen when you overdo it on sugar and over you get, you know, fungal overgrowth in your gut. Plus it's addictive. And, and we know, I mean, sugar, um, if sugar is harmful to the teeth, I mean, teeth, we know that they're stronger even than bones. So... <laughs> Figure out what it's doing to other tissues, including bones, etc. It demineralizes all the tissues ultimately. Wow, <laughs> very interesting. I, I like how you analyzed it in time and to our nature. What's interesting? I, I saw a documentary by, <laughs> and they were talking about how they they engineered the food and literally put MRIs on people's brains whilst they were eating the chocolate, and they would pick the ones that would light up the the brain more so yeah. what, what do you think about that food engineers and <laughs> sugar and yeah this is a lot of it this is called the uh, neuromarketing and functional mris you know they use functional mri for neuromarketing yeah so neuromarketing is looking at the brain mm. responses to different stimuli and see what gives the, the strongest stimuli stimulus you know and response in the brain the stimulus mm. that gives the strongest response and ultimately use that it's called mm. neuromarketing. Uh, it's been done also for a lot of other products, including cigarettes, you know. Especially, really? Especially, yeah. They found, for example, when you put on the cigarette uh, pack- packs, you know, and that uh, it can cause cancer or death or lung disease or, uh, you know, like different or heart disease. In fact, it doesn't discourage people from uh, smoking. On the contrary, it encourages them to smoke because once you induce the fear response in the brain, you shut down the neocortex in the brain and you activate the, the amygdala and limbic system that, that are supposed to, you know, the parts of the brain that are primitive and deal with survival and flight or fight. Mm. And when you're scared, you need more nicotine and other, you know, like uh, substance and cigarettes. Just you, you, you just increases your, your smoking habit, you know, drives it even further because you want to calm down, you know, this fear. 
So they played on that, and they know very well that they're doing, you know. The <laughs> that literally just blew my mind. Because I always saw, because I used to live in Canada, and I used to see the cigarettes with the, literally, it, it looked like a horror movie, what you saw in the yeah, packet. Yeah. It doesn't discourage people from smoking. <laughs> and it doesn't discourage people because they, they it does the it, opposite. They know it well. They know it well, yeah. It's been well studied, this, this whole phenomenon, using functional MRIs. Oh, my God. This is very, very powerful stuff. What about the, the impact of, of sugar on your mood? You said it increases cortisol, but... No, no, not, it doesn't increase cortisol, right? On the contrary, it depresses cortisol oh, really? ultimately. Yeah, okay. It induces insulin production. But ultimately, when you get low blood sugar, you end up with higher cortisol. So initially, when you eat sugar, there are several hormones that are depressed and others that are stimulated. You eat sugar, you stimulate insulin production. Okay. To be able to, you know, get sugar inside the cells. Mm. And the excess sugar, of course, if the cells cannot take it all, it is converted into fat and stored into fat cells, especially in the belly area, which mm. we call visceral fat. So too much sugar can be detrimental to, to, it can create a lot of visceral fat, which is bad for, we know it's bad for the heart. It's bad for the, it could lead to diabetes ultimately, you know, due to insulin resistance. So um, in terms of what it creates in the brain, like you mentioned, it could with the chocolate, definitely it could lead to increased dopamine and other mm. neurotransmitters, you know, uh, phenylethylamine, etc. I mean, a lot of neurotransmitters are, are like mobilized when you eat a lot of sugar with chocolate, etc. And could create this, you know, addictive effect ultimately. Do you feel, <sighs> talking about the addictive effect, do you feel like, because when I eat sugar, I'm going to be honest, this is me just, when I eat this, I will eat more and yeah, more and more and it's definitely. a non-stop process. And so is it an issue of self-control or is it, is it just you're being a victim of the addiction? You're just being a victim of the addiction. Oof. All of this has been studied, you know, <laughs> even like juices, you know, fruit juices that are concentrated juices and they, to which they add sugar, nectars, you know, mm. they have too much sugar and they know this drives you to drink and drink more of it. And the same for any food. And even with the big companies, they know it. I mean, they put uh, more sugar. Now they are, I mean, uh, tendencies to put even more sugar instead of decreasing it because it creates this addiction and you want more of the same. You so buy over, more and more and more. more. Get into a vicious cycle of, you know, overconsumption. And that's what they want for uh, yeah. recurring <laughs> revenue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so to get into, uh, to break the common misconceptions, there's a lot of misconceptions. I want to cover a lot of them. Um, the meat debate. I saw, I've been very conflicted about this because there's a lot of studies that says eating something that's dead is bad for you. Eating something alive is better for you. So the meat diet, the vegan diet. So what do you think about that? And what is your uh, expert advice? So this is a big debate, but we'll go over it in details if you'd like to. Yeah, sure. So in terms of meat, um, the, like you look at meta-analysis, for example, of meat versus with cancer, different types of cancer. Mm. There are a lot of studies showing that meat is bad and a lot of studies showing that meat is good, you know, in terms of cancer. Okay. So what's the conclusion, you know, because people get confused. So I, I would go for um, grass-fed meat. That's very important because grain-fed, the soy and the corn, have been not only genetically modified, <clears throat> they've been genetically modified, in fact, to sustain more spraying of herbicides, weed killers like glyphosate and mm. others. And they can harbor a lot of these which are known to cause cancer. You know, they've been shown to cause mm. cancer. If you overcook your meat, so burnt parts of the meat, you know, it can lead to heterocyclic amines, benzopyrenes, which are known carcinogens. Okay. So burnt meat is bad, you know. So when you do barbecuing, you know, <laughs> you create a lot of burnt parts of the meat. And this is bad. This is carcinogenic. So it depends. If you eat cooked meat, you know, in stews, like we traditionally use it in Lebanon, mm. in the Middle, East, Middle Eastern diets, you know, it's part of the whole stew. It's well balanced. Okay. Middle so Eastern. for people who tell you about, uh, you know, like who are pro-vegan diets on the other side. Yeah. Um, we're not meant to be vegans as humans, you know. So you have in, in the animal kingdom, you have animals that are mostly carnivorous, animals yeah. that are mostly herbivorous. None of them are purely, by the way. Even cows, they do eat insects and uh, small uh, eggs of insects, etc. You know. So and whenever they they did an experiment long ago and they washed the feed of the cows, the grass, 
and the hay, and they ended up very sick, the cows, because they need, they, this provides them with some protein and calcium, etc. You know, okay. They need some of these parasites, insects, etc. And uh, when they looked at, when you look at animals that are purely carnivorous, mostly, I mean, they still eat some herbs from time to time, you know, cats, dogs, tigers, etc. For could be, we think about it, could be medicinal, but also to get some, you know, fiber sometimes to induce vomiting or, so they're mostly carnivorous. But if you want to know what humans should be, because this, this is a big debate over the yeah, centuries, huge. you know, it's not a huge debate. Um, if I find, let, let's say, a remnants, a skeleton of a dinosaur, you know, there are different dinosaurs. And if you look at dinosaurs, yeah. how would you know what they used to eat, you know? Because they tell you the brontosaur was herbivorous, the Tyrannosaurus rex was uh, car mostly carnivorous. It's, they look at their teeth, you know, because mm. these are the remnants. So the teeth, they serve a purpose, you know, to help you get to food. Now we have forks and knives and we have cooking ways and et cetera, preparation modes. But in the past, we didn't have any of this. So the teeth are the main indicators for what we should be eating. And if you look at human dentition, you know, the teeth, we have 32 teeth, basically. I mean, a lot of people don't get them anymore, but 32, basically. And out of, you know, eight teeth, you have one canine. You have, you know, if, if you take one, one, once one quart, quadrant, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you have one canine and you have uh, base two incisors, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the others are uh, premolars and molars. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at uh, carnivorous animals, mm -hmm. um, even the incisors and the molars and premolars, they look more like canines, you know, they have sharper. Mm. So they're meant to, you know, ma mainly consume meat. Mm. If you look at herbivorous, they don't have any canines. Mm. So you look at their teeth dentition. So basically, we're not meant, to, we're omnivorous as a species. We're meant to eat like our ancestors used to eat. So, so this is the best inspiration. And science <laughs> tells us the same. You know, we're omnivorous. We adapt to different environments. You have people in certain areas that if there is not enough vegetation, like the Eskimos, they tend to eat mostly animal pro products. Mm. In certain areas where it's, there's a lot of vegetation, it's very like tropical areas, etc. They tend to be more on the plant-based side, but they still mm. consume meat. You know, so mm. you have people like in India, they tend to be more vegetarian. But this was a decision taken long ago, you know, by the mm. you know king long, long ago to go into this for the Hindus at least. Mm. And they go mostly vegetarian, but they do eat eggs and they eat dairy. So they still eat animal products. They're not fully vegan. Okay. There was a famous uh, Dr. Weston Price who was for 14 years the, um, in the 30s, basically, and uh, 40s. He was the um, head of research scientific committee and research committee in the American Dental Association. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of research on different primitive civilizations, tribes, etc., mm -hmm. to look for the optimal diet and the best dentition, you know, in people. And he looked on people at tribes who were mostly vegetarian; they had worse dentition, and tribes who were more omnivorous, and they included meat or chicken or fowl or different, you know, types of uh, animal produce. They had a healthier uh, dentition, much less cavities and less, you know, mm. and better uh, distribution of teeth. They didn't need really any braces, etc. Wow. And he has a very interesting. He had a very long trip around, like you know the five continents and yeah. showing different uh, pictures of primitive people and their relatives that have been to um, uh, cities, you know, where they changed their diet into more processed diet. Mm. And uh, they looked at the teeth of both, you know, like cousins. And and he saw that people who are still in living in nature and in, in the tribal environment, they had a much healthier dentition than the ones who con started consuming processed foods and sugar and Refined veg, refined uh, starches, etc. Wow, very interesting. <laughs> I love how you simplified it based on the teeth. Yeah, because then it makes it very obvious that yeah. look, um, we don't have canine teeth for no reason. Yeah, and it's very interesting. <laughs> I find that very interesting. We talked about the the aspect of the vegan, right, and how we're omnivorous uh, species. Is it true, because I saw in the um, episode of Stephen Barlett and a um, gut health expert that's called Max Lugaveris, who said that the vegan diet and depression are correlated. They have a, a certain, the more you eat vegan, the more, is it true? 
Over a period of time, yes, I've tried several diets throughout my life and uh, just to for the sake of trying them, you know. So I went vegan and raw vegan at some point. Okay. Initially, you feel much lighter, you feel better because it's not very hard to digest, you know, overall. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's like fasting, you know, like mimicking fasting sort of, you know. Yeah. So I felt much easier, much lighter. Of course, I was consuming very high, high level organic foods, you know, and mostly lots of vegetables, etc., nuts, seeds. And you feel great at, at the beginning, but later on you start to feel depletions, you know, like one and a half months, two months later, you know, towards the third months, start to feel depleted, lower on energy. Initially you feel higher on energy, then lower energy. You get more cravings. And that's not only my experience, it's the experience of a lot of patients I've seen. Mm. And it's uh, easy to identify these patients. So one time I like to tell the story, I have a patient of mine who yeah. I knew for a very long time. A lady in her uh, early 50s, and she came to me um, after, um, you know, after a while, I hadn't seen her, and she came to me, she started complaining that she's feeling, you cannot live with people, uh, you know, I want to live alone, I don't want to go out, people are just wolves, you know, and they're not uh, uh, fun to be with, and there is like always complaining like she was never like that and i told her when did you start uh, when did you turn into vegan you know she said how did you guess that <laughs> <laughs> i told her was it three months ago she said yes <laughs> it was three months ago she got convinced by someone who's a you know sort of guru of veganism okay to follow that i mean all respect to people i mean with their but i mean ultimately she got depleted uh, her brain got depleted and she started to be, you know, like more on the depressive side and anxious mm. side. Uh, the same thing I had before myself when I went into veganism, <laughs> you know, for a while. And um, I told her, I explained to her the whole story that her brain needs a lot of saturated fats from, from you know, good, good quality saturated fat from meat and fish and fish and dairy, etc. And good omegas, you know, omega threes, which are important for to prevent depression. And you don't get EPA from, uh, you know, specific type. You know, you have DHA, which is a type of omega-3 from uh, plant, mm. but it's very difficult to get EPA from plants. I mean, very rare algae, they have EPA, but it's not something yeah. common, you know, to find. Yeah. So you get depleted also in terms of EPA in the brain, which is important for brain function. And she gets also, if she doesn't take care of B12, she gets lower B12, which is an important vitamin for a process we call methylation in the brain. And methylation, if you don't get enough methylation, you get depressed. Oof. Your brain gets it's very important for the brain to have enough methylating agents, you know. So how do you to produce the neurotransmitters in the brain that are important for mood, etc.? So if people who go vegan, they have to get enough B12, they have to get enough saturated fat, good good fat, because the brain, a lot of it is saturated fat. And ultimately, she needs to get enough high-quality proteins. Um, of course, you can get a lot of amino acids from vegetables by combining uh, uh, grains and uh, legumes, beans. Mm. But you need big quantities. And when you go to big quantities, you get bloated, you know, because you have to prepare the beans very well so that you get, you know, enough of the amino acids, etc., and digest them. So ultimately, it's not very practical to be just vegan, you know. We, mm. we should be mostly, you know, omnivorous, a lot of people can be plant-based, but with meat, chicken, eggs, you know, some fermented mm. dairy, etc. And um, when you look at uh, experiments done, I mean, that led to, I mean, it's an extreme experiment that's not uh, ethical at all to, to do, but they've done it in uh, Minnesota. It's called the Minnesota Starvation Trial at the end of the, mm. the 1940s. So after World War II and during the Korean War, there were a lot of hostages, you know, that they, you know, bring back home. Mm. And they had been mis you know, malnourished and they wanted to see how to re-nourish them and what's the impact of starvation on these hostages or prisoners of what? war, you know, prisoners of war. So they uh, did an experiment where they got volunteers, they paid paid volunteers, yeah. and they put them on a starvation maybe for, for weeks, you know. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and uh, at the end of 24 weeks, basically a lot of these people started developing either depression or... Uh, Bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and some of them psychosis, leaning towards schizophrenia, etc. So, if, if when you deplete the brain of basic nutrients, like basic macronutrients like fats, proteins, and you deplete it of also minerals, you know, micronutrients like minerals and uh, vitamins, etc., ultimately it ends up hypofunctioning. It's not functioning properly, which could manifest as depression or other mental disorder. So yes, if you, <laughs> it could be, I mean, if, 
I mean, I'm not saying all people who get into veganism, they can, I mean, some people, if they manage really, really well, but they have to be really experts in nutrition, you know, and mm. dietetics to be able to maintain, you know, good mood, etc. But in general, I mean, you look at look at people who are more, eat more var- variety in the, their diet, they're, mm. they're more joy- joyful in general. I mean, I don't like to generalize, but in general, <laughs> they're happier, they're more at ease, you know. So variety, it's it's very interesting that you say the final word variety because a lot of people are in the bulk season now. So at the gym, going to the gym and eating a lot yeah. of excessive amounts of protein. And so I, I'm very interested in finding out how much the difference of over-consuming in consistency-wise and variety from to optimize for gut health. I mean, in terms of the gut, the gut <clears throat> doesn't like overeating, uh, neither. I mean, it's yeah. like under eating is, if under eating is bad, <laughs> overeating can be worse. You know, we have a lot of disease of overeating nowadays. I mean, mm. so that's why uh, there's a lot of talk about fasting, intermittent fasting, all of that, because yeah. uh, I mean, we're not supposed to be doing, overdoing it. I mean, in terms of eating, so mm. we tend to overeat, mm. especially in, in countries like Lebanon. <laughs> or you have your grandma that, <laughs> yeah. I, your I think the older generations that have, uh, survived the famine of the first and second world war <laughs> they, they tend to look at you know <laughs> they want you to 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 eat more and more and also that so you that look you healthy don't... you know if you're chubby you're healthy for <laughs> <laughs> so that's another extreme but i think if you look at um, when you eat a big meal at at once you know mm. all at once it's very difficult for your digestive system to handle it so a lot of the residual food will end up in fermentation process by the microbes in your gut. Mm. So it's better for a lot of people to eat smaller quantities, you know, smaller smaller meals. Of course, people who want to bulk up, they try and tend to like overdo it just Over. to, to bulk up very fast. But I'm not in favor of that neither, you know. So it's mm. overdoing it, it's not uh, healthy. Unfortunately, I mean, uh, we all believe in muscles and creating muscles for bone health and for general health and metabolism, but over bulking is not healthy neither. Yeah. So we know now that over exercising either there was a study released uh, in the US um, last year mm-hmm. showing if you do heavy weight lifting more than 60 minutes a week you'll be surprised it could be it you start to lose after 60 minutes you lose the benefits of exercising. So if you do just 60 minutes per week of heavy weight I'm not talking about light weights or moderate weights or moderate e- exercise intensity etc high intensity and exercise, including high intensity weightlifting, you know, more than 60 minutes per week can starts, you start to lose the benefits of exercise. At more than 140 minutes per week, it was shown to be worse than sitting at home, you know, being a, a couch potato. What? Exactly. It can show you the studies. Not one study, it's the review a lot of studies. So it's, it's really, that's like, it, they call it a J curve, where you start to lose you know, the, if the impact, the benefits of exercise after, so this is, I'm talking about heavy weight lifting again. If you okay. do light to moderate exercise, you can do much more without any problem. It's in fact, you get more gains and more benefit. That's why I'm not in favor of bulking up. Also, you lose when you, a lot of people who focus on bulking up like massively, mm. they lose a lot of um, mobility, you know, and agility and mm. So it's not good to be stiff, you know. Stiffness is not very good for the body. The body doesn't like to be stiff. It, it needs to be flexible, has a lot of, you know, have a lot of agility. Mm. And uh, so it's good to have a balanced workout. Okay. Not to be like excessively focusing on bulking. And uh, honestly, I mean, you don't see a lot of, uh, you know, people with very heavy, you know, muscle mass make it to the to 100 years you know you don't see the centenarians you see is mostly lean people yeah they have muscles they are fit they're not overweight but they're not also bulky in terms of muscles how much is muscles are muscles important for longevity uh yes it's a, I, I think it's a j curve like the that's what i've just mentioned mortality okay. can increase okay. after a certain level so if you don't have any muscles of course people become more prone to fractures and you know, osteoporotic fractures, which are also very yeah. bad yeah they tend to have uh, bad posture and, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're as healthy as your spine is, you know. So if you have a mm. good posture, good spine, this is very healthy. So the muscles are important. We need to be fit. We need to have good muscles. But too much of it uh, can can also be detrimental to the whole body, like I mentioned. So um, 
uh, the, the, in French they say the juste milieu, le juste milieu, you know, the, the balance, the, the balance, you know, the, the, the sweet spot, the sweet spot, the exactly. sweet spot. Okay, <laughs> I like this. Um, recently, I, I I've been experimenting with a, a lot of diets, a lot of different workout styles, and everything, and I found that fasting really, really works with me. Like I feel so much more energetic where I wake up and until 2 p.m. I work deep work on, on stuff I need to finish. I eat nothing, just water. I feel so much more focused, energetic, happy whilst working. How much do you recommend that? Because in my, in my experience it worked, but would it work for most people? I would not uh, say that works for, for all people because let's say menstruating uh, women who have their cycle, if they do a lot of this, the fasting, the way you're doing it, they can have, uh, get hormonal imbalances. Okay. But in general, like women postmenopause, they can do it. And uh, men in general, they can do it. They're mm. more apt, you know, they have better capabilities of fasting men in general because supposedly we're so, supposed to be hunters, you know, so yeah. we go for hunting for a long time until we find the game. While women have to have bare children and uh, breastfeed, you know, so they have to eat more frequent meals in their childbearing age. So they need to be eating more frequent meals to get the energy, you know, to do that and to keep a yeah. good hormonal balance. Uh, I do recommend intermittent fasting to people, but it's better done like a lot of times I tell people two to four times a week, skipping dinner is better than skipping breakfast because when you skip mm -hmm. breakfast, I mean, I know it works for you, but I'm not, I don't like to generalize. Yeah, yeah of course. So when you skip a dinner, you have, you know, you, you have all the time to detox at night. Your liver is not overburdened. Your mm. digestive tract is not overloaded with food. You have all the time to detoxify and to, you know, like um, a lot of the remnants are recycled, you know, a lot of the remnants, residues, mm. etc. So when you do the uh, fasting in the morning, your body to maintain good level of energy uh, it has to overconsume uh, cortisol to keep your blood sugar st steady, you know. And definitely you feel better because when you fast, you don't, you're not spending a lot of energy on digestion. Mm. And of course, if you do it long enough, the fasting, you get, start to produce ketone bodies and ketone bodies give a lot of clarity to your brain. Yes, you feel I more feel cl that. Clarity in mind. So when you do it the, the proper way, you get more clarity and you feel better. Uh, but normally as humans, I mean, uh, even... I mean, a lot of people, I tell them not to do intermittent every single day mm. because we're meant to binge from time to time. So look at, um, you know, how we used to be. If we were nomads long ago, nomads, when they go from one area to another, I mean, they're fasting for a few days yeah. intermittently. I mean, they still eat some food, but they, they try to distribute the food so that they can keep having food every day. At some point, they arrive to, let's say, an area, an oasis or an area, a forest, you know, or a jungle, etc., where there is a lot of food, you know, mm. fruits, and then they start to binge, you know, for a while. It's fine to binge from time to time, yeah, <laughs> but not every single day. Binging every single day is bad. So the Lebanese table with, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with everything. It's too much. <laughs> yeah. um, that's very interesting because I feel like before my diet was very off. Mm. And recently I realized the power of not wasting energy on digestion by eating too much and yeah. too frequent. Yeah. So... Do you recommend one meal a day? Because that's what I'm currently doing ish. I don't like to generalize one meal a day to everybody. Okay. I would say two meals a day and maybe okay. three meals a day from time to time. It's better. You okay. know? And some people, if they're you know, in burnout and they're very tired and they have a lot of, you know, you know, like they have night shifts, etc., they okay. might need to eat more frequently, like every three to four hours. It okay. depends on your activity, etc. So it's not always the uh, recommended to do one the meal a day. The golden rule. There is one study who's shown like if you do one meal a day, you can increase cardiovascular disease. Oh, okay. Because your body has to, uh, you know, entertain a lot of, you know, secrete a lot of adrenaline and cortisol to maintain normal blood sugar, blood levels of fatty acids, etc. Okay. And you end up with uh, with more tendency to have, you know, imbalances in your hormones. It could affect your heart, you know, heart rate, etc. Mm. So it's it can be like kind of uh, detrimental to your health. Okay, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Um, I like how you're not generalizing stuff because every yeah. single it's tailored. Yeah, for yeah. Every There's person. no one diet fits all. Definitely okay. not. It depends on the age group. I mean, children have to eat more. You cannot put children, kids, on one meal a day. They need to grow and they need to eat more frequently. Mm. You cannot put them on intermittent fasting either. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, they can do it from time to time. Like once, twice a week, they skip dinner. It's fine for their yeah. health. I mean, not to be overdoing it on food, but they need food to grow. 
when you grow up, I mean, as a grown up, it depends on your activity, how much physical exercise, brain work you do, etc. And then later on, older age, <laughs> it depends on, uh, I mean, if they, they, we should try to be, I mean, still eat a lot of good good fats for the, you know, not to, to lose, but also keep a lot of good protein because with older people, they tend to go into what we call sarcopenia. They lose muscle mass, and this mm. is bad for their bone health, for their posture, for the risk of falling, fall risk. Yeah. And you don't want them to fall, you know. So so you want to, and they have, have poorer digestive systems in older age, so you want them to be able to uh, eat enough protein and easy to digest protein. Okay. So it depends on the age group, on the f- male, female, on the activity. Mm. All of these have, has to be taken into account. Okay, agreed. I know it's to be true because I've tested it myself. Some things don't work for me that others have worked for, worked for others. And this has worked for me. So people should perhaps test exactly. and see for they themselves. They can test. They can test, see how they feel about it. Uh, so I saw a quote on your profile that really interested me that said, it was by Mark Twain, it said, it is easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. And so what do you think about that in the food industry? Yeah, there's a, there are a lot of examples about that in the food industry. We've spoken about sugar, yeah, but there's also food additives, especially like uh, colorings, for example, or food taste enhancers like MSG. Yeah. So take MSG, which is monosodium glutamate. Glutamate basically is a neurotransmitter in our brain, and it also has receptors in our tongue. Mm. So whenever you taste something uh, that has glutamates, you feel it's tastier. Like what? Can you give? Like no, natural occurrence of glutamates can be in meat when you overcook meat or when you prepare broth or like uh, seaweed. Okay. You know, it gives you this, enhances this umami taste, you know, and soy sauce, etc. So whenever the food industry detected this and they started adding uh, MSG, you know, monosodium glutamate yeah. as a taste enhancer in concentrated forms. And this is makes any food taste better. They they did a, an experiment on rats. They put two bowls of the same food uh, and they offer them to rats and they one of the bowls, they add MSG, monosodium glutamate. And once the rat tastes from the side, I mean, they taste, come and taste from both bowls. Once they taste the one from the other side, the one that has MSG, they yeah. never go back to eating the one without MSG. So it's, it gives such a, an enhancement to the flavor of the food that you feel it's fantastic. You know, it's known that in a lot of the Chinese restaurants and a lot of the mm. uh, Asian foods and uh, also in uh, fast food chains, you know, they use a lot of MSG mm. and, and also in chips and processed foods, crab sticks, um, stock cubes, you know, which is artificial stock. It's not the real bone stock and bone mm. broth. The stock cubes, they use a lot of MSG and can be hidden sometimes under names like yeast extract or casein extract or other names. So, so it's hit, a taste it's, enhancer. So mm. it, it's, it, and they did experiments back in 2005 where they, we used to think that's only at the level of the tongue that they get this effect and can get to the brain through the eating food, you know. But they did injections on mice and rats to see the impact bypassing the tongue effect, you know, the taste enhancement yeah, at the yeah. level of the tongue. And they still had the effect at the level of the brain. So okay. it's an addictive substance. And it's used in animal models to create obesity, you know, overweight and mm. diabetes in animal models. So no wonder with the epidemic, you know, pandemic of obesity worldwide and diabetes, yeah. type 2 diabetes, it could be linked. Part of the culprits could be MSG. Yeah, it's not the only one. It's the overeating carbs and sugars and other like uh, you know processed foods, but this is one of the culprits as well. This is a way of the for for the food industry to fool people mm. <laughs> into thinking that this food is tasty. While it's not, I mean, you can put any anything and add to it uh, taste MSG. enhancer MSG and it tastes better than it is. You know. <laughs> what and and the rats experiment is very interesting because. Yeah. If they never go back, it shows that there is something Addiction. here that's addictive. Yeah, exactly. That's addictive and that's exactly. kind of fooling you to yeah, go to towards that. Yeah, you know, eat that food. Wow, very interesting. Um, what about gluten, which is an issue I've faced a lot, and I've realized that when I cut down on gluten, I have so much more energy, and I'm in such a better state of mind to work more effectively, and so. What do you think about gluten from your expert opinion? 
personally, I have gluten intolerance, so I know it, how it affects me mm-hmm. personally. But um, I mean, there are people who can do without gluten. I mean, they, 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 people who can, I mean, they can eat gluten and not have any problem. Okay. But uh, according to a lot of research, it, they might be a minority afterwards. I mean, it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that everybody, all the majority have celiac disease or gluten intolerance. But a lot of people cannot digest gluten to start with. So it's estimated that 83% of people do not have the enzymes to digest gluten. Wow. So normally we have protease enzymes in our gut that come and digest, supposed to come and digest gluten, which is part of wheat. And um, while trying to digest it, they got stuck on it. The mm. gluten protein has something called stop sequence which funny enough is also found in casein of the um, Holstein cows that are the most you know, famous cows that are, produce a lot of milk, the white and black cows. Mm. So they share this similarity, these types of proteins in, in terms of stop sequences on the protein that block the enzymes from being able to digest them. So you have normally, let's say you eat chicken or eggs or meat, they have protein digesting enzymes called proteases. They come in the gut and the intestines and they start to digest the proteins and they go to other proteins and other proteins and other proteins. Yeah, It's like you have at home scissors. Uh, you don't buy a new scissor for every time you're going to cut paper. You know, So you have a few scissors, one for paper, one for chicken, one for uh, fabric. Uh, and this is how it is for with enzymes in the gut. You have a smaller number of enzymes compared to the very big number of food molecules that enter the gut every day. Mm. And these cut a lot of the proteins. Whenever they, you, they meet uh, casein or uh, gluten, they end up being stuck on it and you lose the, these en- this enzymes so you cannot digest other proteins. And the, pro- the proteins sit there and they're not well digested. That They go undergo fermentation process, putrefaction. Mm. And they lead to toxicity and bloating. And you end up also with the partial malnutrition because of that. So this is what happens to people who cannot digest gluten. Mm. It doesn't necessarily turn into celiac disease immediately. So a minority of these cases end up with celiac disease. Okay. But a lot of these, they have digestive issues with gluten due to the stop sequence. And ultimately, some people who end up with uh, leaking these proteins across the intestinal lining into the bloodstream that have not been digested, Mm. they end up with immune reactions against these proteins, including against gluten itself. And this can develop ultimately into Mm. gluten intolerance. And the extreme of it is celiac disease where there's total, you know, we call it atrophy or like sloughing off of the, Mm. you know, like flattening of the intestinal lining Mm. and losing absorptive surface. You know, like you cannot absorb food properly anymore. The immune reactions in the blood, they have a different, you know, dimension. Mm. They can lead to um, more... um, of a, uh, um, yeah, you know, allergy-like reaction sometimes, but a lot of it is immune reactions. They can promote autoimmune disease. Mm. They can lead to, like, for example, thyroid, autoimmune thyroiditis, Hashimoto has been linked to, to this. Multiple sclerosis have been linked to gluten intolerance mm. and celiac and other autoimmune diseases. They have been linked to that. Mm. Uh, so I, I uh, ultimately, um, what made people Uh, more attracted to gluten um, is the fact that most likely gliadin, the subfraction of gluten, can transform in the bloodstream into what's called gliadorphin. And gliadorphin can act like an opiate, you know, like a morphine on the brain. Like a drug. Like a drug. And that's probably what attracted people to to, to be addicted to gluten and to wheat products ultimately long ago. And to bread, to everything, white, so white pasta, white bread. White. All, even whole grain, it's not, they all have the same. Oh, really? Even so whole there's, grain? There's a whole theory that this is what attracted people. So come to think about domestication of wheat. Yeah. The first consumption of wheat is, uh, I mean, the first evidence in paleontology, you know, and... Uh, is comes goes back to eighty thousand years ago, mm. but we the act the paleontologists and historians think that most likely around ten thousand years ago, uh, humanity started to domesticate grains, cereal grains and mm. uh, beans and plants, and uh, they think that we used to be nomads, mm. hunter gatherers, and whenever we uh, do- started domesticating plants and animals especially plants, we started to uh, settle down, you know, cause you use settlements, you know, and, mm. you know, near the, 
near the uh, fields of barley initially in the Middle East. It started in the Middle East here with barley and then wheat and the Far East rice. So with wheat and barley, they started to have settlements around these and later developed them into villages and ultimately into towns and later into cities. So this is how, how civilization, the area, <laughs> developed, uh, most likely due to domestication of barley and wheat. Mm. And uh, why were they attracted to this? Because you grow the grain, you put the grain in the soil, it grows your plant, and this plant gives you a lot of other grains, and you can multiply the number of grains. Mm. And no, no, most notably is that the plant uh, grains, they, are, they have in them, in them the, uh, all the nutrients to, to create a whole plant. So mm. they're high in nutrition, very dense nutrients. But at the same plant, at the same time, the plant has to protect itself against, you know, it's predators and predators is mostly, you know, when the grains in the soil could be rodents like rats and mice or uh, 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 worms mm. and the whole plant, the predators are like herbivorous animals like cows and horses and sheep and goats. Mm. So ultimately, if the plant, the plant cannot run away from and its predators. Yeah. What it can do, it can create in its uh, grain a sort of digestive inhibitor. Mm. That's why most seeds of plants and grains, they have digestive inhibitors. So when mammals come and eat them and other, other animals come and eat them, uh, consume them, uh, consume them, they cannot digest the grain. Yeah. They can digest the whole plant, but not the grain. Mm. And ultimately the grain would, part of, at least big parts of the grains, you know, big number of grains would be released in the stools mm. to grow new plants. Mm. So this is the plant survival mode. So when humans... Uh, figured out that there's a lot of nutrition in, in the wheat grain and the barley grain. They started to grow them, but we never consumed them uh, raw. You know, you cannot come and consume wheat raw in, in the raw form. You get in, severe indigestion. Yeah. <laughs> and the same for beans. You know, we cannot. So they found ways of preparing them uh, to be to make them more easy easier on the digestive system. Mm. And uh, if you look at uh, in the Old Testament, like in the Bible. Uh, the book of Ezekiel, there's something, preparation of Ezekiel bread. And there's in Qumran also in Jordan, they found the uh, manuscripts of the Essenes, you know, where they prepare the Essene bread. There's always a pr whole process, you know, to prepare the bread. And that's this is how we prepare. I mean, now it's, I mean, got much faster, but they used to sprout the grain, tiny mm. bit. It's not full sprouting, but germination. Mm. Once it germinates after a few days, they grind it and mm. then they uh, leave in it or they let it ferment with, on, on the bacteria in the air and the yeast in the air. Mm. And then it, when it ferments, it's broken down partially and part of the gluten definitely is broken down. And then they would cook it, you know, they put it, they bake it. Mm. And this is, this whole process leads to easier digestion. But even with all of that, we still have parts of it that's not easy to digest. What okay. makes it easier to digest, not fully easy to digest. Mm. So that's why people developed, we think that people developed back then a lot of problems that started with all of this. So no wonder that in the whole area here, we start to mm. have sort of, uh, you know, imbalances in the hormones that ultimately led to, uh, for example, polycystic ovaries and women could be part of it, you know, like eating more bread mm. in the area. Mm. It could be part of it because this is where it's all started. Mm. Of course, eating too much carbs to start with creates belly fat, visceral fat, insulin resistance. Yeah. But cooked carbs above 115 degrees, they could lead to what we call acrylamides. And these substances, they deposit in the tissues and they're not easy to, to, to digest and process by the liver, for example. Okay. So ultimately, they accumulate and create more insulin resistance. So all, all of this contributed to the visceral fat, you know, belly fat, mm. which ultimately led to type 2 diabetes. So you come to think about it, you know, like you see the first evidence of type 2 diabetes in Egypt, you know, and the Ebers papyrus. Mm in history and in the region here we started you know to have like these boldness male pattern boldness <laughs> which is due to nutrition deficiencies at the same time hormonal imbalances mm. so all of these could be linked to the wheat consumption okay but at the same time it's so tasty wheat because <laughs> because of the starch and also the like i mentioned possibly gliadorphin linking so it's a sort of addictive food because <laughs> we eat it here especially in lebanon bread Hummus, bread, 
Yeah. Meat, bread, <laughs> labne, bread with everything. Yeah, yeah. And that's a tradition we have. <laughs> it's very tasty food. <laughs> it's very tasty, of course. Um, talking about visceral fat, <laughs> talking about vis visceral fat, um, I saw a statement that's really powerful also by um, the, the author of Genius Foods, Max Lugaveris, who said, the larger your waist grows, the smaller your brain gets. That, that for me is very intriguing. I mean, it's a bit of a, an extreme statement. I mean, you have a lot of big thinkers who, are, uh, <laughs> who had big bellies as well. <laughs> <laughs> like Socrates, a philosopher, you know, had a, his, his statues are his portrayed as having a big belly. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably a big consumer of uh, wheat and... <laughs> Uh, we have famous, you know, uh, you know, artists or uh, creators or authors. <laughs> that are so also it's not necessarily true. I mean, I don't think it's uh, okay. I mean, definitely having very heavy digestive, uh, you know, uh, a lot of food to digest will will drain a lot of blood away from your brain. But ultimately, when you're well nourished, your brain functions better. You know? mm, <laughs> mm, mm. Even we if we ultimately get sick, you know, but the, still the brain can. <laughs> uh, so he's referring to basically to uh, too much sugar and too much carbs that could lead to what yeah. they call type, type, type 3 diabetes of the brain, you know, like Alzheimer's. Yeah. So that's what he's referring to. But that's the ultimate thing that happens. But Alzheimer's not only that. I mean, it's a lot of multifactorial. Uh, disease or condition a lot of it has to do also with toxicity a lot of could be sometimes uh, mm. you know insults to the brain uh, concussions mm. you know um, could be also um, a lot of um, you know bacterial toxins now they're discovering fungal toxins could affect the brain the mm. so it's not only sh sugar or definitely sugar plays a bad role yeah, and the development of Alzheimer's not only that. So mm. we can. I don't like generalizations. It's a way nice way of putting it. You know, it's very yeah. It's very catchy, catchy, exactly uh, catchy way or caricature. Yeah, but uh, it's not generalizable. That's it's not generalizable. Um, to go into the solutions, mm. I want to dive into the how of how to fix things. Getting into the how to reset your gut, how to have kind of cheap ways to improve gut health without breaking the bank, <laughs> what should be the plate composition, the best food pro proportions for best gut health, the top five foods to avoid destroying your gut, the top five foods to heal your gut, um, and an ingredient list of what people should consume more of to have a healthy, healthier gut to promote more energy, more focus, more peak performance in their life. So let's start first with gut health reset. So what do you think... First of all, what's the time frame to fully or reset a large portion of your gut? I, I, I would say it's very individual. Okay. But on average, it takes 4 to 12 months to do it. To 4 to 12 it. months, okay. Not before, I mean. And what's kind of the process or the formula to do it the right way? If you don't want to do it through a very in an expensive way, you know, through a lot of supplements, <laughs> <laughs> possibly medications, you can uh, eat more uh, like uh, fermented foods. I mean, but in the right way, you know, like like uh, fermented dairy, but good quality dairy. Mm. Uh, you know, from uh, well uh, tested animals, you know, and of course not uh, well fed. I mean, with a with a good grass fed most of the time. Or like free range goats, you know. Mm. Um, this is good. Fermented dairy could help with probiotics. Fermented okay. vegetables, you know, like uh, pickles, it's not but homemade, so not too much uh, processing and not too much, not, not too many chemicals. Of course, using only like fresh ingredients and homemade. Yeah. So pickles are very good if you use the right kind of pickles. Okay. Like sauerkraut, for example, for a lot of people and kimchi, etc. And you can find also um, uh, to heal the gut lining, bone broth is a good way of mm -hmm. so making stews with bone broth and bone bone stock mm -hmm. and meat stock. So this is very good. Uh, trying to eat a variety of food and not overeating at one sitting. Yes, yes, sit. You know, 
So trying to separate fruits from uh, the meal, you know, keep mm. the fruits away from the meal, fruits, so like four hours away. Okay, interesting. After the meal and one hour before, uh, not to have like, because fruits are easily digested and if you, and they're easily fermented. So if you mm. put them on top of a big meal that na- needs six to eight hours for the di- to digest, mm. they're going to ferment meanwhile. Mm. So it's not the best way to eat fruits. So usually look at if you come to look at it none of the animals do more than mono dieting so animals do eat one type of food at a time normally mm. so we 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 are the only species that tends to you know eat a lot of foods at the same time mm. so we I, we like variety i like variety i like lebanese food i like this <laughs> in a lebanese restaurant so the don't get me wrong on that but at the same time, I mean, this uh, after we eat like a ton of foods, we tend to eat all this. We they they tell you move to the fruit uh, yeah. <laughs> table, you know, <laughs> and they get you all the sweets. So this is a recipe for fermentation. Okay, there's too much sugar, too many organic acids that lead ultimately to a lot of fermentation. And fermentation, in simple terms, for someone who it doesn't leads know, leads to fungal overgrowth and bacterial overgrowth, and you end up with bloating, and that's why people order. Like soda drinks and <laughs> after, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is the. Uh, I mean, eating in a simpler way. Yeah. Um, leaving the table not fully, not full. Mm. So um, there are a lot of good sayings and, and the traditions in the area here from the basic and a lot of the, you know, like prof- religious leaders and prophets and doctors yeah. in the area. So. One of them is not like you sit at the table, uh, sit at the table like uh, wanting food and leave the table wanting food as well, you know, design mm. food. So it's not full, you know. <laughs> so that should be a philosophy people take yeah. take away from this, that you come wanting food and you leave wanting still a bit want, less food. A bit less food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but still not overdo it, you know, not to be overdoing it. Not to be fully sashi. No, exactly. And like half of the food uh, feeds you and half of the food kills you. The other half kills you. Ah, okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. I like that saying. Okay. So what are the best food proportions? So imagine we have a plate, right? What would be the proportions of that plate? What would you put? I would put half of it salads to make it easier to people. Half of it is not only salads, it's vegetables. Half okay. Of it. Could be raw or cooked vegetables. Anything you recommend specific? That's no. I mean, I don't like to. Um, it's like season in season. Eat what's in season. Okay, eat what. It could be like in in summer we eat more raw vegetables, in winter more cooked vegetables. Mm. So let's say half of the plate should be uh, vegetables. Okay, it depends on the season. Dominant dominance could go for cooked or versus you know uh, raw. Okay, the other half is split between a bit of carbs and protein. You know. Okay. So carbs and protein, and definitely protein has fat. And there is olive oil and the salad and and the vegetables. So you have fat here and there. So this way you have a very balanced, uh, it's in a simple way. You don't have to, I mean, we can go in numbers, etc. But people are not going to go come and sit at the table and weigh their food. And weigh their food. Uh, You talked about, the. um, so protein-wise, what do you recommend as top protein for the gut? Um, Ideally, I mean, in the old days, long ago, fish used to be very healthy protein, but yeah. not anymore, unfortunately, because we've uh, polluted the seas with microplastics and there's too much mercury. Mm. Uh, due to the industries, there's a lot of polychloral biphenyl PCBs. Yeah. So all of these are carcinogens and toxic to the brain, to the you know, yeah. to the heart. So fish used to be the best protein and not mm. anymore. I mean, now I can count amongst the best protein is uh, definitely if you take eggs, uh, but free range eggs, organic, yeah. are very good. They have a very good balance of protein and fat and nutrients, minerals and uh, vitamins. Mm. Um, the other is, uh, I mean, if free range organic chicken is very good, mm-hmm. and meat as well if it's coming from a good source and well prepared in the right way. I mean, cooked slowly, cooked, not burnt, and mm. uh, coming from uh, free range uh, beef or sheep, lamb, you know, or, um, uh, or uh, goat. Mm. it's fine I mean I would say per week I mean I I don't like to generalize I mean between two to four times red meat per okay. week one to two twice once to twice chicken okay 
maximum one fish and go for small fish, so, uh, sardines and mm. you know like other types of small fish, and maybe one or two days per week uh, vegetarian vegan. You know, like not to eat any and okay. eggs you can consume depends on your needs requirements in terms of activity and protein but between twice a week to five times a week you know depends on the requirements it's cool what's really cool about this is that everything we talked about culminates to the solution which is the um we we are omnivorous, omnivorous species exactly. <laughs> and now you're saying okay you should eat but in a way that uh facilitates the way yeah. we are our yeah, nature yeah. so that's yeah. very interesting um <laughs> Now, just to finish it off, what are the top five foods to avoid destroying destroying gut health and all the negative consequences? Yeah, let's go into that first. So, before food, I'd like to mention antibiotics because I mean it's the the easiest way to destroy the gut. The gut mm. micro, microbiome is or good bacteria is through antibiotic intake. Yeah. And uh, when you think about antibiotics, I mean the problem with people they self medicate. I mean it should be antibiotics should be restricted to doctors orders you know mm. the problem with uh, pharmacies here they tend to give antibiotics to any comer you know mm. and people with the first runny nose which is most of the time viral they end up with taking antibiotics and broad mm. spectrum ones so this is very destructive mm -hmm. but the biggest consumption of antibiotics in humans um, and this is a has been sur a surprise long ago when we did research on, on antibiotic consumption in humans yeah 60 to 80 percent is from animal food they, because they give animals, uh, unfortunately, this is ma bad practice in agriculture. They tend to give animals, let's say cows or chicken, they tend to give them a lot of antibiotics mm -hmm. when they're in, uh, bred intensively because they're close to one another. Mm -hmm. And they want to prevent if one of them gets infected, not to infect the others. So they give them antibiotics in what we call preventive way or prophylactic way, which is very bad because ultimately this and uh, the antibiotics end up in the foods we're consuming, you know, like the animal produce. Mm. So in the dairy and the meat and the eggs, chicken, etc. So the the problem with uh, too, much, too much antibiotics is we're getting these antibiotics and a lot of them are forbidden to be used, you know, from use in, in humans. <laughs> and they use them in animals. <laughs> <laughs> so studies have shown the 60 to 80%. Mm. So this is huge. This is big. Mm. So when I... When you tell people to go f eat organic, yeah. most people think about organic fruits and vegetables. But when we need to think about when we say organic is mostly animal produce because <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> this, these are, this is the main problem because they tend to get a lot of antibiotics and also pesticides, herbicides because a cow eats, uh, <laughs> eats more, much more than a human being and they eat, tend to eat, I mean, when they're fed grains, they soy and, and uh, corn, yeah. a lot of it has been sprayed with herbicides and pesticides and they end up in the milk and the, the meat and we mm. end up eating them. So when you think about, about organic, we have to think mostly about animals and the animal produce being organic more than fruits and vegetables. I mean, of course, it's the ideal to have everything organic, but it's not that easy. Yeah, to find. Time. But I would go for more for animal food yeah. that's organic, more than even vegetables and fruits and vegetables. Yeah. That, that's... Uh, so these are killers because herbicides, yeah. we know they kill the gut flora. I spoke about glyphosate previously. Yeah. And, uh, this, uh, you know, herbicide, wheat killer. It kills the intestinal bacteria like an antibiotic. So you have antibiotics in food, but also herbicides that act like antibiotics. So it, these are on the top of my list if you want to go for <laughs> protect your gut. So there's um, antibiotics, there's the animal products. Yeah, that are fed antibiotics and fed also glyphosate and glyphosate itself, you know, the, the weed, weed killer. Weed killer. And um, is there like two more that people should be aware of? Too much sugar, definitely. Sugar I mean, it also. promotes fungal overgrowth and mold overgrowth. And uh, starch in general, they process starches, okay. like refined flour, all of these, they tend to be very bad for the gut. So avoid it at all costs. Yes. Okay. In terms of the opposite, so five top five foods to heal the gut and I, to promote. I mentioned a few like fermented the dairy. 
Okay. Like yogurt, labne here, uh, you know, fermented cheeses, but fermented with good bacteria instead of mold. So the labne here is good to eat? If it's pr- well done, you know, you have chemical labne as well in the market, you know. Yeah. Labne that we make it from starch. There's some of labne can made without dairy, zero dairy, but it tastes like labne. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that's not good. <laughs> So you need real fermented, you know, I go for small pro- producers, you know, which authentic, uh, that do testing, mm. make sure there's no, no bacteria, harmful bacteria mm. in the milk, no listeria, no brucella, etc. Mm. And then you go for uh, pickled vegetables, like I mentioned previously. Mm. These are healthy for the gut. Bone broth, I mentioned bone broth, yeah. bone stock. It's healing for the gut and the gut lining. And um, eating uh, vegetables, I mean, vegetables, if cooked and raw, they're good because they have fiber, yeah. good quality fiber, soluble fiber that are healthy for the gut. They promote, they act like prebiotics to promote good bacteria. Mm. So when you hear online that they tell you about lectins and that you should not be eating vegetables because they defend, the, they defend themselves, of course, the plants defend themselves. But traditionally, our ancestors found ways of preparing plants in a way to reduce mm. these lectins. Mm. And, and uh, one example is uh, when you eat um, uh, dandelion, hindbe, or chicory, mm. uh, we don't eat it raw. I mean, the, no, the, way, the traditional way of eating it, you, they, like, they um, boil it, mm. then they um, strain it to rinse the water out. This way they get rid of a lot of anti-nutrients like oxalic acid and others. Mm. And uh, then they cook it. And they add lemon to it and olive oil. Lemon to help digestion? To help on digestion, also to uh, compete with oxalic acid because it has citric acid that pre- pre- reduces the risk of you getting like kidney stones and like a difficult mm. digestion from oxalic acid. So they, were, they developed our ancestors smart ways of preparing food. Yeah, yeah. Intuitively and also through practice, you know, so yeah. it took them maybe decades or centuries to develop that. Yeah. But they, we have them; their traditions. Mm. And it's good to keep these traditions. So if you hear a lot of people say like, "Oh, don't, don't boil the," I mean now, like, "Don't boil the uh, dandelion or don't boil the spinach." Of course, you have to boil it. If you don't boil it, it's very hard to digest. Plus, yeah. it's very uh, it can cause kidney stones. You know, ultimately. Mm. So let's look at science together with traditions. When you mix science and traditions, you understand better how we should eat. So Mm. they're mixing science and traditional ways of doing. Because traditions, they have, they proved their way through centuries. We cannot just say now, oh, they were wrong. No, no. You study traditions and try to understand what they were doing. And then this leads you to better understanding how we should be eating. So our ancestors had a lot of the foundations right in yes, terms of eating. Yes, yes. I mean, the first uh, fermented uh, cheese in the world and the first cheese in the world is kishik here. It was started in, yeah. in Lebanon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kishik is basically yogurt with uh, wheat, wheat, you know, broken wheat. Yeah. And the, the fermentation led to better digestion of wheat and better digestion of dairy. Mm. And it makes it easy. I mean, uh, my grandmother, when I was a child, <laughs> if I get the diarrhea, severe diarrhea, she used to get kishik, uh, you know, like <laughs> raw kishik, not cook it. She doesn't cook it. She does mix it with water. Give me balls of kishik. <laughs> this is natural probiotics to restore normal, uh, normal, uh, you know, to stop the diarrhea and to restore normal bacteria. She fought bacteria with bacteria, with good ones. The bad bacteria, she fought them with good bacteria. That's that's remarkable because <laughs> uh, it's a game of balance, as we saw, right? Yeah. That's the you need to have predominance of the good ones, mm. but even what we call the bad ones, they're never absolutely bad. You know, they even worms and parasites and fungus yeah. and mold and all that. In small amounts, they're good because they know how to detoxify certain mm. uh, food items or ingredients in a way mm. that to make them less harmful. Yeah. They've seen in one study, like uh, in one of the worms in the gut, they, it has harbors 109 fold the amount of mercury that we can harbor in our body. You know, so, so it's, 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 it's fact it's taking out mercury, pulling off mercury from the food, and metabolizing itself. You know, so it's protect, protecting in a way our yeah. body from the mercury. Yeah. So of course, too many parasites are bad, but a bit of parasites are good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's. 
very very powerful stuff already <laughs> everything we've we've covered i think could really transform the health of a person watching it genuinely provided so much value to me cuz i health is my number one priority this year cuz it's the pillar of everything else you exactly. don't have your health you have nothing humanity has realized uh, that after covid that <laughs> <laughs> the new paradigm <laughs> Well, what's good, what's bad is health, you know. So yeah. It used to be other paradigms, predominant, you know, that health was there, but in the background. Mm. Now health We knew it was important, but it came to it the wasn't forefront, important. yeah, in the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's why I think this episode genuinely is so meaningful. And thank you so much for your time. I thank you for and, um, having me here. And if people want to reach out to you or learn more about uh, gut health or nutritional therapy or they all can, the rest they can go on on the instagram green clinics lebanon yeah we have a great team of dietitians and a lot of health experts who are you know like trying to educate people mm. on the best uh, ways to have become healthy and uh, fulfill their you know full potential of performance in life Perfect. That's amazing. I'm going to put all the links <laughs> in the description so you, you'll have that. Uh, for the people watching, I thank you for investing your time too into improving your health and improving your life and your performance. And if you enjoyed the episode, let me know in the comments and which parts you enjoyed the most. And it's been your host, Adi, and this was another episode of the Rich Inside Podcast. I hope to see you on the next week. Much love. Ciao. Thank you.